Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to welcome each and every one of you to uh, worship this morning hour. And uh, it's always good. It's always good to gather together with God's people, brothers and sisters in Christ, in worship. Such a privilege to, that we can do this each and every Sunday. And it's, uh, it's good to be here, isn't it? Let's um, open this uh, worship service with a time of, um, of silent prayer, asking for the Lord to open up our hearts and minds to, the, uh, to what's being said this morning. Father in heaven, as your word is open before us this morning, convict us, dear Father. Convict us, Father, by the power of the Holy Spirit that we may be more and more formed to the image of Christ, your Son. Father, we thank you for opening this place up and drawing us into worship. Father, may the noise and the concerns of this world be kept outside of these walls that we may concentrate and meditate on the joy of worship in this morning hour. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. This morning we have a pastor, missionary, friend, a friend of many of us, um, Jonathan Falk. He will be... Uh, um, Presenting the word this morning and this evening. So, uh, without any further uh, introduction, I'd like to welcome Jonathan. Thank you, Brian. Yes. How good it is to be with you this morning and to join with you in worship, driving on the snow covered roads from uh, Racine, just a mile outside the city limits. Um, reminded me of my challenging years up in Maine, uh, driving in my truck with studded snow tires and bags of granite grit in the back for ballast and also to put under my tires when we got stuck. And uh, one day driving up to northern Maine to a little chapel we had where the, I think I was the only four-wheel vehicle on the road. Everything else was a snowmobile. And uh, the Lord was, was gracious. Uh, and uh, bringing us up there, a three hour drive, and bringing us back on a number of occasions. So I keep reminding myself, I know I was younger uh, in those years, but uh, the Lord watches over our going out and our coming in. Our call to worship this morning is taken from Psalm 96, familiar words of uh, this psalm calling God's people, summoning them to worship and to praise. Psalm 96, verses one through three. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name, tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. Let's call upon the name of the Lord now in prayer. Our Father and our God, and let's stand together, please, as we pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you that your word summons us into your presence, into the presence of Almighty God, the maker of heaven and earth, and the one who is the God and Father of children redeemed by the Lord Jesus Christ. You have set your glory high above the heavens, for you have created all things, and we praise you for your works of creation, but we praise you for your great mercy, which has cleansed us from our sins through the blood of your Son and has called us into your church. We ask that you would receive our glad adoration, our thanks, grant that we may honor you in our worship so that at all things you may be glorified. 
And hear us now, Lord, as your people, we pray together the prayer our Savior taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Remain standing while we turn to Trinity Hymnal 62. Sing to the Lord, sing his praise, all ye peoples. seated. Please turn with me in the back of your Trinity hymnals to page 795. We are adding one number to the psalm listed in your bulletin. We're going to be reading responsibly Psalm 32, one of the great psalms of uh, confession of sin penned by King David, uh, under the inspiration of God's Holy Spirit, this morning in our message, we'll be considering not only the forgiveness of sins, but the clothing of Christ's righteousness, the gospel as it's preached in the Old Testament scriptures. And here too, in Psalm 32, we hear a clear declaration of the gospel of God's grace. We'll read Psalm 32 responsibly. I'll begin and you'll read the bold print. Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord does not count against him, and in whose spirit is no deceit. 
When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you while you may be found. You are my hiding place. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you and watch over you. Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the man who trusts in him. Let's come before the Lord in a prayer of confession. Our Father and our God, we thank you that your spirit-inspired word is sounded not only in our ears, but through that mysterious operation of your Holy Spirit, it penetrates the depths of our heart. It searches our consciences, it brings to memory things that we have done displeasing to you and things that we have left undone that you have commanded. We know, Father, that we have fallen short of your glory. We have acted out in many ways in our thoughts, our words, our, our actions, that original sin going back to our first parents' fall in the garden. And yet, Father, you have not left us in that state of sin and misery, but in your great mercy and in your love before time, you have determined to save a people for yourself, for your own glory. And we thank you that by grace, through faith in our Lord Jesus, we can be numbered among that people. And so we ask, O Lord, that as we examine our hearts, our consciences, our minds, our whole person in your holy sight, we would flee to you this day, claiming the blood of Christ, which is sufficient to sprinkle our consciences clean, to forgive us of all the things we have, have done or failed to do that dishonors your holy name, and that you would assure us by the promise of your word and the workings of your spirit, we are your dearly beloved children. We are forgiven, we are declared righteous, we have right standing in your sight through the righteousness of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And we have that sure and certain hope of an eternal inheritance in your presence, undefiled, unfading, unimperishable. Oh, Father, assure us of these blessed truths as we have confessed our sins and as we've heard this gracious gospel promise this day. For we ask these things in our Savior's name. Amen. Please stand with me now as we confess our Christian faith together, and we will use the words of the Nicene Creed found on page 846 in the very back of your Trinity hymnal. As we approach these ancient words, I'm always reminded of a text, a beloved text of mine in, in the Old Testament. Jeremiah 6.16, where the prophet says, Stand by the roads and look and ask for the ancient paths, where the good way is, and walk in it and find rest for your souls. Well, in God's providence and in his kindness to the church, he assembled some extraordinary pastors and theologians, elders, centuries ago to put together this Nicene Creed that is a clear exposition and confession of our Trinitarian faith in the gospel of God's grace. So Christians, what do we believe? We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. 
and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, <coughs> who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And we believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's remain standing while we turn to hymn 172, Let Us Love and Sing and Wonder, 172. Let us bow our heads together in uh, prayer to our Almighty Father. Our merciful, kind, and gracious Father, the one who has upheld this present creation in our lives and the lives of our loved ones until this very moment. 
We have been privileged to enter into another year, a year in all its history. Father, it's all known. It's already been known to you completely. Every detail, every event. Father, everything we will encounter in this world and all the experiences we will encounter, Father, you already know them. Father, and should... Should our our Savior tarry in his coming, Father, we pray that this year will be the coming of your kingdom. Come into the hearts of the people in this church and around the world. Father, this year may, we pray, Father, will be the coming of your kingdom as it will continue to break down the darkness of this world. As we look around us, we leave another year behind us, a year of confusion, a year of fear, a year year of uncertainty. A year, Lord, that we know when, that you have been calling us time and time again as a nation and as a world Father, the question we face this morning is whether or not we have been humbled by it. Whether we have come on our face before you in repentance. So, Father, in the beginning of this new year, on this first Lord's Day, we come bowing our heads, our hearts before your majestic throne. It is a throne that is glorious. It is a throne that seems unapproachable, especially to those who are burdened with sin and with guilt and do not know you. But as we draw near to you this morning, may our hearts be encouraged to come to your throne because you are a God full of goodness. A God who is long-suffering and full of compassion. A God who delights when sinners like us return again to you. May this be our theme song of the year. That we come nothing in our hands to bring. But simply to thy cross we cling. For clinging to your son, our Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. We have already have already an immediate access to the heart of you, our Father. So, Father, as we come this morning in this light, may our encouragement and hope be stirred that you never change, that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Father, as we open the scriptures this morning, we pray that we would be taught on how to be to be, uh, Father, and how our lives are called to you and how our, our lives are called to glorify you. Father, remember each family who are present here in their particular circ- circumstances. Last year may have been difficult and a trying year. It may have been a prosperous year for some. Father, whatever our year may have been, as we enter this new year, may our eyes be all fixed upon you. As fathers and mothers in the training of our, of our children and give to our children and grandchildren who have received a sign and the seal of your faithful covenant promise and everlasting knowledge and understanding of Jesus Christ in an ever-present evil world. Continue to manifest yourself in our hearts. Sanctify us, Father, as a congregation, as a church. Bless us. Bless those who have been called to lead. All those who have been given the tasks and ministries within this congregation, we pray that you will uphold them and give them strength and wisdom for the tasks they are called to fulfill. Bless us as a congregation, as we submit to the leadership that you have placed over us. Father, grant uh, grant 
that we would receive your word this morning and this year to come with meekness, with joy and humility. And Father, beginning on this Lord's day, that we would not forsake the assembly of ourselves together as the manner of some have. Even as we see the day of the Lord approaching, may we more and more desire to be together with your children and to speak more of the things that your word testifies, the promises and the gospel that your word testifies to us, the goodness and your faithfulness and your graciousness. Father, your word is full and complete. It is all that we need for this year and whatever our lives will encounter. Father in heaven, this morning we commit to you our marriages. Father, bless all the marriages of this church. Father, bless those who are making plans for marriages. Father, how we pray that you will be the center of every marriage of this church, of this body. Father, we pray for our young people. We pray for our children. Father, in this year, turn their hearts. Father, we pray to Jesus in prayer. Father, we commit to you, Father, those who are suffering. Father, we think of, uh, think of Doris Mulder. Father, continue to Strengthen her. Father, we, think, we, we, we pray for John Henning's um, heart issue, Megan's father. Father, how we pray that, um, Father, that you will strengthen him, but above all, Father, that you will rest his heart and his soul and give him, through the power of the Holy Spirit, the saving knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we pray for Diane, meet her sister, Deb. Lord, we think of um, Bjork's uh, uh, Stu and Jill's daughter, Barb, with a broken ankle. Father, we, we, we pray for John Ol uh, Greg Olzinga's father. And Father, we give you thanks for Mike's father, who has, been, has returned home from the hospital. Father in heaven, we pray for Jake Friesma. And Father, how we pray that you'll continue to be with him and uh, be with Jan. Father, may they not feel alone, but Father, may they feel your ever presence of comfort and, and strength. Father in heaven, we um, give you thanks for our, our retired ministers. Father, some that come to mind is... Uh, is Jonathan Falk here, who's uh, filling the pulpit this morning. We also think of uh, Neil Terpstra, or Neil um, Tolsma. Father, we think of uh, um, David King. Lord, the other uh, retired ministers, Lord, we thank you for their service. We thank you, Father, how you have used them in your church and on the mission field. Father, as you continue to use them, continue to bless them with strength. Father, we pray for, uh, Lord, we, uh, we, we, we give you thanks for, for Neil and Lenore's uh, blessing of 62 years of marriage. What a blessing this is. And Father, we pray for uh, Lenore's hip uh, as she uh, uh, has undergone uh, hip surgery. We pray, Lord, that you will be able to uh, continue to strengthen her. And Father, as our bulletin announces, Lord, we celebrate with Neil another one of his books, the words that you have given to him to write. Father, may this book be a blessing to so many people. Father, we pray for those who are traveling in this time, for those who have traveled. We, we pr thank you for giving them traveling mercies and for those who continue to, tr to travel. Give them traveling mercies, we pray, dear Father. Father, we pray for the governing authorities that you have put over us. Father, many of those do not know you. 
Father, we pray that you would work in their hearts and their lives, that they would understand that they are called to rule with integrity and with the knowledge that they will stand before you one day and give an account of every one of their decisions, every conversation, everything they've engaged in as a public servant that you have assigned them. Father, we pray that you would be pleased to work powerfully through our governing authorities to overturn the ungodly laws of this nation. Ungodly laws, Father, which instead of protecting human life, Father, they take it. They snuff it out. Instead of protecting marriage between one woman and one man, Father, the ungodly laws destroy that. Father, work through them and in them that they would lead with a godly fear submitting to your authority in all things. Father, you've gathered us here to worship. Give us joy to worship. Give us joy in this hour. And Father, we pray that you will feed us until we want no more. We ask for your blessing on this worship service and upon your word as it goes forth. Father, illumine us so that we will see the wonderful truths that you have in store for us in your word and is, and is stored up for us in the preaching of your word. Father, bless Jonathan Falk this morning as he opens your word and as he preaches your word this morning and this evening. Father, hear our prayer, not because we are so worthy, but for the sake of Jesus Christ. In his name we pray all these things. Amen. At this time, I would ask the uh, deacons to come forward to collect the uh, morning offering. Let us continue our praise and worship of our God by standing together and turning to Trinity Hymn 141, God in the Gospel of His Son, 141.
Bibles, please, to the next, next to the last book of the Old Testament scriptures, book of Zechariah, chapter 3. If you are reading a, from the Bible in the Purach, there it is found on page 794. Reading from Zechariah, chapter 3, verses 1 through 10, a series of visions night visions, visions given in one night uh, to the prophet Zechariah, and uh, we're looking at the fourth of these visions. Please listen carefully now to the reading of God's holy word. <clears throat> then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was standing before the angel clothed with filthy garments. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, remove the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you and I will clothe you with pure vestments. And I said, let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments, and the angel of the Lord was standing by. And the angel of the Lord solemnly assured Joshua, thus says the Lord of hosts, if you will walk in my ways and keep my charge, then you shall rule my house and have charge of my courts, and I will give you the right of access among those who are standing here. Hear now, O Joshua, the high priest, you and your friends who sit before you, for they are men who are a sign. Behold, I will bring my servant the branch, for behold, on the stone that I have set before Joshua, on a single stone with seven eyes, I will engrave its inscription declares the Lord of hosts. <coughs> Excuse me. And I will remove the iniquity of this land in a single day. In that day, declares the Lord of hosts, every one of you will invite his neighbor to come under his vine and under his fig tree. May the Lord add his blessing upon the hearing, believing and doing of his holy word. <coughs> There is a great problem that stands in the way of every human plan. 
And that is true whether it is government programs on a grand scale, and we've seen some of the biggest ones proposed uh, in recent days, or, in, in, or, or it's equally true when it's our own personal plans. And that problem is human sin. Sin is the infection that contaminates the human race and it poisons all of our plans. It twists our desires, it corrupts our motives. Sin is a guilty and a polluted status before a holy God. And it is the moral equivalent of wearing defiled garments in the presence of a righteous king. But the problem of sin affects not only our plans, but more importantly, God's plan. God has a plan in, declared in scripture to reveal his glory to all of creation and then to, stem, to extend the glory of his kingdom authority in his son to the ends of the earth. But God who can do his holy will on earth, even as he does in heaven, he must first deal with the problem of human sin to fulfill his plan. And that's what we see in Zechariah's fourth vision of the night. God in his kindness and his kind providence to his people Israel had placed a friendly ruler on the Persian throne, Cyrus the Great. And he had issued a decree, an edict, for the Jews to return to Jerusalem to rebuild the city and eventually the temple. And in the first three visions of Zechariah, God had spoken first of rebuilding his city, of returning his people, and then of gathering the nations. And when we hear that word nations in the Old Testament, it's the Hebrew word goyim. Hebrews, that word has come over into Yiddish. We Gentile, we who are Gentiles by birth, are goy, are goyim. We're the nations of the earth. And God has talked about gathering them to himself as well. God himself would dwell in the midst of his redeemed people, a holy people, and he accomplish all of his purposes. But as we study this fourth vision together, we learn that God must deal once and for all with the problem of human sin. God cannot ignore sin or simply dismiss it if he is true to his righteous character. That's the great thing that I think has been lost from our modern way of thinking. It used to be previous generations, even if they did not have a personal faith in the Savior, the Lord Jesus, had a sense of the justice of God and the fact that sin would one day be, must be accounted for. It would be punished. And that has largely fallen out of our way of thinking in our fallen world today. Well, God must deal with that problem of sin if he will remain true to his righteous character. And if these prophetic visions are to come, become true. And that introduces our first point, Satan's accusation. We see that in verse one of our text. The problem of human sin is symbolized in this vision by a man named Joshua, not the successor to Moses who uh, led a war of conquest there in Canaan. Uh, that was centuries earlier. This is Joshua, who was the high priest uh, at that time. Joshua was on trial, is on trial in a dramatic courtroom setting. We see that in verse 1. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan at his right hand, standing at his right hand to accuse him. Now, the text doesn't tell us exactly where this scene is taking place. Is it in the unfinished temple there on, on Mount Zion when Joshua was going about his priestly duties of offering daily sacrifices? Or is it a vision that is taking place in the heavenly courtroom? You'll notice that there are some very striking similarities between this description and the first two chapters of the book of Job, where Satan appears there in the heavenly council of angels, and he accuses Job's, a God's servant Job there in that heavenly courtroom. Now in the case of Job, Satan's accusations 
are false. Job did not serve God simply for what he could get from God. But here, we have a very different situation in the case of Joshua, the high priest. Satan has a very strong case to present against him. You remember that the function of a high priest, his task is to represent the people as a whole. And Joshua is standing there in the courtroom of heaven representing the entire nation there of Israel. So Satan's accusation against the high priest points out the unworthiness of all those, both Jews, but I think we Gentiles are included here because they're mentioned there in the third vision back in, in verse 11 of chapter 2. All those whom God had promised to save in these earlier visions. If Satan's accusation sticks and Joshua is found guilty, then so would all the people that he represents be condemned. And here is a nation, the people of Judah, the people of God, returning from an exile that was imposed upon them because of their sin of idolatry and rebellion against God. Point is, things do not look good for Joshua or for the nation. So Joshua is the defendant. The angel of the Lord is seated as the judge, and Satan is the prosecutor. Standing at his right hand, we read, to accuse him. Now the word, the very word, Hebrew word, Satan, means, and we have a helpful footnote if you're using the ESV or perhaps some other Bible, the very word means the uh, adversary or the accuser. And here there is a, a definite article, the, ha, satan, standing in front of Satan. <coughs> so it could be translated, the adversary, the accuser. Now, Scripture tells us many things about the devil, perhaps not as much as we would like to know in our curiosity, but enough to be warned about him. He is the deceiver. He is the tempter. He is a roaring and devouring lion. He is a persecutor of God's people. He is a murderer from the beginning. But one of his most sinister roles, his most evil role, is as the accuser of God's people. Satan, who is the very one who tempts us to sin, now he's acting as our accuser before God, pointing out all the stains of our sin. We might add that Satan is also a great actor, a great pretender. And here is one of his most convincing roles. He's, he's acting, the play, he plays the part of the outraged prosecutor in the court of God, which is a very personification of hypocrisy, isn't it? But he's using the weapon of accusation. And accusation is a very powerful weapon in God's hands. He often uses it against us as the people of God. It can discourage, discourage us in our work, our ministry, and in our worship. In fact, in the whole of our Christian life before God. And that discouragement, which is sometimes called by pastors, wise pastors of, of previous generations, spiritual depression, that spiritual depression is, God, is Satan's goal for us. Like that high priest Joshua, we fear that God is going to reject our worship and turn away from our service, not accept our service, because of our sin. What a hypocrite you are, Satan whispers to our conscience. Others are worthy of salvation, but not you. So why don't you just admit it and quit trying to be so holy? Why don't you just enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season while you can, and then despair of salvation? <clears throat> the great reformer Martin Luther, who knew what it was to be afflicted, by Satan's lies, he said, he said this, that Satan, the devil, tempts us to magnify our sins and look at God's judgment and take our eyes off of Christ. But the vision 
of Zach and Zechariah continues. In verse 3, we read, Now Joshua was standing before the angel, clothed with filthy garments. We know that Joshua was that high priest appointed by God to offer daily sacrifices on the altar there in the courtyard to finish the temple apparently at this point had not yet been finished. Now some scholars suggest that perhaps Joshua's garments, his high priestly garments, would have been smudged with, with soot and ashes from those burnt offerings. But the filthy garments described here are not caused by smoke and by soot. The word filthy is far more graphic like that. If you have a farming background, it's the kind of mess that's caused by falling and rolling around there in the barnyard. It's utter and absolute defilement that would disqualify Joshua from his office at priest, as high priest. And Joshua is silent. He can say nothing at all in his defense. Nor does the angel of the Lord who is present deny the charges brought against Joshua. The great preacher in Victorian England, Charles Spurgeon, put it like this. If Satan wants to accuse us, any page of our history, any hour of the day will furnish him plenty of material for his charges. If that old accuser wants reasons for accusation, he may indeed find as many as he wills and continue to accuse us as long as he pleases, for we are altogether an unclean thing. But that leads us to our second point, the Lord's rebuke. And we see those words in verses 2 and 3 of our text. Joshua remained silent, but the angel of the Lord had something to say. They're words of, of power, they're words of authority, and words of great hope for Joshua and for us. From these words, I think the angel is the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, whom we address as the Lord Jesus Christ in what we call his pre-incarnate form before he was born of the Virgin Mary and took upon himself a true human nature and a true human body. There were appearances in the Old Testament scriptures of the pre-incarnate second member of the triune God. As the angel of the Lord speaks, we read in verse 2, and the Lord, now it's not just the angel, it's the Lord said to Satan, as sinners we have nothing to say to Satan's accusations, but the angel of the Lord, uh, the Lord Jesus can reply in our behalf. And notice what he says to Satan. The Lord rebuke you, O Satan. Brothers and sisters in Christ, this is our only hope. Christ himself taking up our defense and silencing all of Satan's accusations against us. Christ is that long prophesied savior who will come to crush the serpent's head. You know that gospel promise, that first gospel promise found there in the opening pages of the Bible, Genesis 3, 15, where God says to the serpent after he has tempted Eve and, and Adam, I will put enmity between you. I will put hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And that bruising of the head of Satan is nothing less than the end, the crushing, the, the destruction of Satan in our behalf. The Lord rebuke you. He says, not because we are innocent, but for two reasons that we see here in the text. First of all, verse 2, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. The Lord Christ rebukes Satan on the basis of God's electing grace. Satan's accusation against Joshua also maligns the Most High God, God the Father, who associates with his high priest Joshua. And the angel of the Lord here replies with the answer, God's election, because of Israel's standing with God, his promised covenant mercy, his tender grace, 
towards his people. It has never been grounded upon their own worthiness. God had chosen to deliver his people from Egypt, and now he would restore them to him to his city and restore his presence there, dwell with them in their midst, simply out of his own sovereign purpose and grace and mercy. This is what Moses told the people, and that text we perhaps referred to often, Deuteronomy 7, 7 and 8, it was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love upon you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all people. <coughs> but because, but it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your father. Brothers and sisters, of our, of our standing, before God, if our status as God's people depended on our own faithfulness, that why then we would be cast out of God's presence forever. But Joshua's hope, the, and the hope of these returning exiles, and our only hope rests upon the character and the faithfulness of the unchangeable God who has promised to redeem a people for his own glory. So Paul writes to the believers there in Ephesians 1, verses 4 through 6. In love he predestined us to be adopted, he predestined us for adoption through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace. What's the practical application of this doctrine of election for redeemed sinners like Joshua and redeemed sinners like us? Well, instead of our mouths, our own mouths being shut in guilty silence, Satan's accusations against us are stopped. I'll refer to another quote from that great Calvinist preacher, Charles Spurgeon. If God has chosen his people, then it is of no use for Satan to attempt their overthrow. Christ meets Satan with the high mysterious truth of election, of electing love, which was settled before the world began. And like a chain, he throws it into Satan's mouth to silence him. In those words, the Lord has chosen Jerusalem. Let that be rebuke enough. And so with this doctrine as our foundation, the doctrine of God's electing love, we rebuke our own doubts and fears. For if God has chosen us in his beloved son, Christ, then we are resting in him by faith. And that is the reply we throw to Satan. But there's a second reason for this reproof, reproof from the angel of the Lord directed to Satan. Is not this a brand? And if you have a little footnote, a brand there is simply a burning stick that is plucked out of the fire. What a vivid description that is of every one of us who have been, uh, whom Christ has delivered from condemnation. I think that fire in, in the time of Zechariah would have been a, a figure of speech for the exile. God brought his people back from suffering there in Babylon. But by snatching them from the fires of exile, God reveals that his grace is far greater then their guilt. Satan, the deceiver, tempted God's people to forsake their God for idols, which led them into deeper and deeper sin. Idolatry was the root sin, the mother of all sins, and then all kinds of other abominations, some of which we see in our own society today. More and more, they flow out of that root sin of rejection of the knowledge of the living and true God. But now Satan is silenced. God has begun to deliver his people from their sin. And the Apostle Paul offers that same comfort to us. In Philippians 1 verse 6, God who has begun a good work in you will bring it to completion in the day of Christ Jesus, in the day of his return from heaven. And so the devil is effectively silenced by the work of God in us. That leads us to our final point. Sin removed and righteousness granted. And we see that in verses four and five. And the question that we began with, and it's really the background question in all of this, how can a holy God accept a defiled sinner like Joshua and all those whom he represents? 
We've seen that they are chosen by grace, by God's electing love. They're plucked from the fire. But how does God deal with the problem of our guilt and corruption? If you've read descriptions there in the book of Exodus in the Old Testament, you know that those priests had to be spotlessly clean to enter God's presence. So how can God accept this high priest, Joshua, who is dressed there in soiled and defiled clothes? Zechariah's vision answers with the act of sin removed. I think we realize that when we're reading Joshua's description, it is a description of all of us here. His filthy clothes is a picture of us. Isaiah writes those familiar words, chapter 64, verse 6, we have all become like one who is unclean, and all of our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. If you grew up on the old King James like I did, all our righteousness is as filthy rags. But the angel of the Lord gives this command here, remove the filthy garments from him. And then he says to Joshua, Behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you, and I will clothe you with pure vestments. That's another reason why I believe the angel of the Lord is none other than our Lord Jesus Christ there addressing Joshua uh, directly. What a stunning picture of forgiveness and cleansing Joshua sees, or, or rather Zechariah sees. There's some hard sections to this book, brothers and sisters. I've wrestled with it as I've read through to try to understand some of these details, but this should be abundantly clear and really grab our imagination. Remember the high priest was the one who offered sacrifices for the sins of God's people. And Jesus Christ is the true high priest to whom Joshua in the Old Testament foreshadows. There in Hebrews 9, 11, when Christ appears as a high priest of the good things that have come, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by the means of blood, of the blood of goats and calves, which is what Joshua was offering up, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. And I think perhaps most of you realize that that in Hebrew, Jesus' name, Jesus is the Greek form of Joshua. The Lord saves. Jesus is that Joshua, the final Joshua who is to come, who cleansed this earlier Joshua through his own, uh, through his own future coming to die as an atonement for sin. Some of you may have heard this story. Wartburg Castle in Germany is where Martin Luther was he was kidnapped by friendly knights, uh, sent out by Frederick, his prince, Frederick the Elector, after his heroic stand there at the Council of Worms, where Luther's life was forfeit. And he was taken to that remote castle, and he was very productive during this period. He translated the entire New Testament into the German language. Uh, but he felt keenly the accusations of Satan against him. And at one point, apparently, Luther dreamed that Satan appeared holding a long scroll with all of Luther's sins written out and read aloud. And Luther was probably about half the age I am, and some of us are here at this point in his life. And yet, uh, Satan held a long scroll with all the sins that he had committed. And Luther replied in his dream, you debated in his dreams. He debated virtually everyone in his day uh, taking the stand for the gospel. It's all true, Satan, and many more sins which are known to God alone. But write this at the bottom of your list, the blood of Jesus Christ which cleanses us from all our sins. And then as the story goes, and this story may be somewhat of a later edition, what we call apocryphal, he grabbed an inkwell off his, tape, uh, his writing table and he threw it at the devil. And if you go to Wartburg Castle to, to, today, the, the guides will show you a little black spot on the wall above his desk where that ink spot is. That may or may not be true, but this, this argument with the devil was recorded by Luther himself. Well, that's how we reply to our guilty fears and to our troubled conscience. We look to the blood of Jesus Christ who says to us in verse 4 of our text, Behold, I have taken your iniquity from you. But there's a second act. 
didn't stop with just the forgiveness of sins. There's a second act and final act that the angel of the Lord did for Joshua. <coughs> Excuse me. It's not enough for us to have our sins forgiven. We also need a righteousness to, in which to stand before God. And so the angel of the Lord says there in verse 4, I will clothe you with pure vestments. And what Joshua received was not his own righteousness, but the righteousness of another, what the reformers called an alien righteousness, literally from out of space, but one that appeared here on earth, our Lord Jesus Christ. The righteousness of Jesus Christ, which he earned for us through his perfect obedience to the Father. Isaiah, the prophet, sang of this gift of righteousness. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God. For he has clothed me in the garments of salvation. He has covered me in the robes of righteousness. Brothers and sisters, there are two great benefits granted here. Received through faith in Jesus Christ. The forgiveness of sins and the clothing of his righteousness. It's what we call justification by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. But what's the significance of that turban? And I'll move very quickly through that. That the turban has a little phrase on it, holy to the Lord. And that goes back to Isaiah 28, uh, verse, I believe it is, or rather Exodus 28, verse 36, where we have a description of the high priest garment, Aaron, the first high priest, and a turban is placed on his head with a little gold plaque written, holy to the Lord. And it signifies here that God has placed his name on us, and it symbolizes the assurance of our acceptance in Christ, but also our calling to live a life of godliness, of growing likeness and conformity to the Lord Jesus. Let me close with just this, and we'll move into the celebration of our Lord's Supper. Satan finds us when we're weak. He comes to us when we are physically exhausted, when we feel spiritually de depleted, sometimes after a, what we might consider a personal victory in our lives. <coughs> and we know from experience as we grow older, there's a natural, <coughs> often a natural letdown that occurs, kind of a, a law of oscillation that moves up and down in our lives. And we hear that voice in our conscience saying, you are a very great sinner. You put yourself beyond the re reach of God's grace. And so what's our re reply? Do we try to defend ourselves? Can we point to the righteousness uh, of, of our own? Or do we rest in the gospel proclaimed by Zechariah? And we say, yes, I am a great sinner. But Jesus Christ is a greater savior. This great good news of our pardon and the gift of Christ's righteousness is so clearly expressed in that there's a hymn, recent hymn, I think it's written by Keith Getty, Before the Throne of God Above. And that second stanza, when Satan tempts me to despair, tells me of the, and tells me of the guilt within, upward I look and see him there who made an end of all my sin. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied to look on me, to look on him, rather, look on him and pardon me. That's the answer to Satan's accusations. We look to the cross where that precious blood of Jesus was shed for us. We look to his perfect life, which is credited to our account before God. And God has placed his name on us as his dearly beloved children, holy to the Lord, so that henceforth, by God's grace, we may live for the one who loved us so. Amen. Let's pray. Father, impress these glorious gospel words upon us when we are weak, when we feel worn, when we are sorely tempted to despair, not only by the deteriorating situation in our own society and in the world around us, but in our own heart and mind, assure us that our sins are forgiven. 
Enable us by faith, by grace through faith, to look heavenward and to see a Savior there who loved us and gave himself for us, who clothed us in his righteousness, and whoever lives as our high priest to make intercession for us. Strengthen us through these words by your Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's respond to the hearing by turning to hymn number 520 that speaks of the blood and righteousness of Jesus Christ. 520.
And at the Lord's Supper, we remember how the Passover feast, one of the great festivals in the Old Testament, pointed ahead and found its fulfillment in this meal. You don't see the, the pastor, or you don't see the heads of the households here slaughtering in a lamb and having to offer up a sacrifice and sprinkling that blood on the doorpost. That is a bloodless meal and not a sacrificial meal that we are partaking of today. But there was another feast that we should recall, and that is the Day of Atonement. The single day each year under the Old Covenant when the high priest would enter the Holy of Holies to make atonement for his sins and for the sins of the people. And now Zechariah hears the Lord say to him, I will remove the iniquity of the land in a single day. That single day is what we Christians call Good Friday. It was the darkest of all days because it was the unjust execution of God's Holy Son, Jesus, which took place on the cross. And for the people of God, it was the best of all days. For on that cross, Christ took away our sins once and for all. On that single day, the promised stone laid the foundation for the eternal temple by making that perfect and final sacrifice of his own blood, which he offered to God as the perfect and final high priest. We as living stones in Christ Jesus, through faith in him, are resting securely on that foundation for our salvation. But there's a promise we didn't really touch on in our text this morning, in verse 10, the last promise, of neighbors sitting together under the grapevines and under the fig trees. I had a grapevine over in Africa, Eritrea, I didn't sit under it, but I parked my truck under it as a shade, a cool shade in that hot sun. But that image in the Old Testament speaks of the security and the blessing of God's saving rule over his people. We're enjoying, brothers and sisters, a foretaste of that promise at the Lord's Supper. But the fullness of that awaits the return of Christ in glory, and we shall die with him at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Christians today, as we heard in the, in the elders' prayer this morning, and I've made reference to it, we have a growing sense of what is the spiritual barrenness and emptiness of our modern society. And yet in the gospel, we have the privilege of inviting our neighbors to join us beneath that, that fig tree and vine of God's saving grace through faith in Jesus Christ to enter into the communion of saints and the communion of the stable. God's plan for salvation was not simply to redeem Joshua from his sin and then sit back and see what would happen. God gave this vision to direct us to a greater Joshua who would come, Jesus Christ. Salvation does not depend upon our abilities or our efforts, but on the fact that God sent his son, who would be a royal branch and a priestly stone to secure that forgiveness of sins and blessing for those who do. The Word of God, as we read just moments ago, calls us to examine ourselves and then to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. And these simple elements, two elements set before us, remind us that it's for sinners like us that our Savior offered his blood on the cross and poured out his precious blood. It's for redeemed sinners who trust in the forgiveness and the gift of his righteousness that our Lord gives us. This supper is a means of growing in our knowledge of Him. The Word of God calls us again to examine ourselves so that we may discern and understand the significance of the Lord's body given for our sins, so that we may partake of our growth in the grace and knowledge of the Lord and Savior. Parents, we are asking young people not to partake until they've made a public profession of faith have become community members. And if you are visiting with us today, we welcome you. If you've made a public profession of faith and are a community member of the Evangelical Church of Jesus Christ, a, a true Church of Jesus Christ, you are welcome. The reason for this council comes from Christ himself. Everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. Let us pray. Father, we would consecrate these elements to you through prayer and through the hearing of your word. 
We ask, Lord, that by your Spirit and Word we would examine our hearts. And though we mourn our sins, we would not despair. But we would flee to Jesus for cleansing. And we would claim those promises that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. And will forgive us our sins from all unrighteousness. Prepare us now to commune with you as we partake of these elements. That our hearts may be lifted heavenward. And we commune with our risen and exalted Lord. For in his name we pray. Amen. Our Savior, on the same night that he was betrayed, he took bread and blessed it, and he broke it and gave it to his disciples. As I minister in his name, give it to you.
disciples, Jesus said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. All of you drink it. Let's pray. Almighty God and Heavenly Father, even as we have assembled in your name this day, and we have heard your word proclaimed, we have fed upon that word. We pray, O oh Lord, that that spirit would bring your spirit would bring that word to bear deeply in our hearts and minds in the coming days. But we have communed at your table. We pray, Father, that this sacrament given to us by our Savior. To remember always the significance of his death, of his sacrifice, of his life and body offered for our sins. That it might be a true means of grace. Help us to go from this place rejoicing that our sins are forgiven. And we pray, Father, that you would grant us those growing new desires to forsake sin and walk in paths of righteousness. New powers through our union with Christ who is above to live a life of heavenly values and purpose here in this fallen world, testifying to your grace and goodness. So we do ask these things in our Savior's name. Amen. Our closing hymn is 420. Let's stand together at the line, Lamb's High Feast. 420. <laughs> Thank you.